Okay, everyone. Well, welcome to another Record Live. It's Thursday afternoon, and today we have a very special instalment um, here. We've got a very special guest, John Boston from the USA. Thank you so much for joining us, John. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, Melon. <laughs> we were discussing our official titles before, and uh, um, in <laughs> Australia, we tend to go by nicknames. I'm Melon. This is Jono, and... Uh, Jared, what would you stacks. be? Stacks. I stacks. often get stacks. People can't <laughs> say stack or roth, so stacks it is. <laughs> well, um, yeah, today we have a very sensitive and important and kind of a heavy topic to discuss. Mm. But before we get into the real meat of it, John, would you just like to introduce yourself a bit about um, what you do, your family and where you're from? Sure. John T. Boston II. I just moved back to the United States from Australia. I was serving as the evangelist for schools in the North New South Wales Conference. And uh, I currently am an associate professor at the Adventist Theological Seminary. I teach in practical and applied theology and uh, lead our field schools for our seminary students going into the field, as well as uh, leading in public evangelism across the division, supporting public evangelism across the division. My uh, official title, uh, we use it in North America, not necessarily in Australia, is uh, Associate Director for the North American Division Evangelism Institute. My wife is Carla and my daughter is Riley from the Adventures of Riley Madison. And uh, we live in Michigan, Southwest Michigan. It sounds like you're you you're a very busy man, John. You've got <laughs> the teaching and the work you do for NAD, the evangelism um, director there. That it sounds like a lot. It, it's a lot, but it's rewarding. It's rewarding. Even I was excited to see so many uh, innovations developed during this pandemic and quarantine, and so I was excited to be able to support some of those initiatives. Hmm. So tell me, what, what is the current climate where you are? I know uh, America has been hit really hard by coronavirus and then all of a sudden this you know, rioting and all of this stuff started happening. What is the general feeling where you are at the moment? I, I think it's different for different people. Um, for, for, I think in general, America is a tense, it's at a tense, a tense place right now. I, I remember even when I landed uh, coming back from Australia, we stayed in Hawaii for uh, a little, a week or more, and uh, then LA, and then we kind of made our way back. And as I, when I landed in the South, where I'm from, the Southeastern United States, Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, Alabama, all of those states down there, um, I, the tension was already present. There, there's um, political tension, there's a tension between uh, evangelical movements and, and, and non-Christian uh, organizations. There's tension, uh, white and black. There's just layers of tension. America is still a beautiful country, still a, full of beautiful people. But I think that the coronavirus uh, has uh, allowed those things that have gone unresolved for so many years to simmer and uh, I think those tensions are at an all-time high. I don't think they are at an all-time high. We've... All good? <laughs> Sorry, I think I just lost, I dropped out for a minute there. But um, yeah, so you, you mentioned some of the tensions. Can you just, for those that, it's all over the news at the moment, um, John, but can you just fill us in a little bit about um, the situation as it's unfolded? A lot of um, talk has been around the George Floyd death uh, by the policeman, the killing by that policeman, but that's not the only sort of... Um, incident that's happened in the lead up to some of these these protests is it so so can you just tell us from your perspective as an african american in america and you've been watching this situation for us in australia can you just give us your summary of events and how that's sort of been unfolding and maybe where it's come from 
Sure. I, well, I, I, I really great question. And thank you both for allowing me to be here. And uh, I miss being in the South Pacific Division, but I'm glad I get to be home to help uh, navigate and be a, a, a positive voice and, and, a, and express my voice and share my voice in this experience. Well, there, there's a lot of layers that are involved here. And I want you to give me a moment to unpack that. And during when coronavirus first hit in the African American community in the black community, there was this idea that it wasn't going to affect us. But after the first five weeks, we started getting reports that it actually disproportionately affects African Americans. So you're not just talking about people that have only 10% of the wealth capacity in America, the African American community. Uh, we're, you're talking about, it's not, it's not socioeconomic, you're talking about its race. And so that, that was a very difficult blow to the African American community. Um, in the wake of that, to hear about a young man named Ahmad Aubrey in South Georgia, the state just above Florida, uh, Ahmad Aubrey was out uh, and two Caucasian men, a father and son, uh, tried to detain him and ended up killing him. And so this is in the wake of coronavirus, African Americans are getting hit. Then there is this overwhelming tide of concern about how is it that two non-law enforcement people would kill Ahmaud Aubrey, who could have potentially just been out on a walk or run in their neighborhood. And but because he was uh, black, because to them he was suspicious looking, they wanted to detain him and they wanted to detain him at arm at arms with weapons. And so that be, that was an issue. And then um, there was a young lady, Breonna Taylor, who was shot and killed in her home as police officers now. So now you've got another issue because one of the challenges we face is these issues get conflated. You have racism and then you have the socioeconomic factors, the systemic issues, and then you've got police brutality. And so all of these things are, you can see where it's starting to boil as and it rightfully should boil, okay? We don't want it to boil into violence. We don't want it to boil into destruction, but we want to, we want to deal with it because it, it needs to be dealt with. And so uh, give me 60 seconds here and I'll finish how we got here, how I believe we got here. So yes. Ahmaud Aubrey, then Breonna Taylor, police are serving a warrant, but they're at the wrong home. Mm. And they killed her in her home. So now this is all in the course of 10 days. We get reports that the African-American community is at higher risk from uh, coronavirus because of some of the systemic issues that our community faces uh, with access to health and practices along those lines. And then you've got Ahmaud Arbery, then you've got Breonna mm -hmm. Taylor, and now George Floyd is a police officer, Caucasian police officer, puts his neck, uh, his his knee on his neck, rests his weight on him, a practice that is prohibited in many police departments across the United States. It is, it is, I served in law enforcement as a chaplain and I loved what I did. I love those officers. I love police officers, but like uh, mm -hmm. one comedian says, Chris Rock, policing is not the kind of profession where you can have bad apples. It's like pilots. You don't want pilots and say, we've got a few bad apples and some of them crash sometimes. It's a very, right, yeah. very difficult uh, scenario. And so that was the boiling point. And then initially the uh, county attorneys, the prosecutors did not feel that there was enough evidence to prosecute that officer for killing George Floyd. Uh, the officers that killed Breonna Taylor had not been, no arrests had been, uh, warrants had been issued. And it was a delayed response to uh, actually bring charges against the two men who killed Ahmaud Arbery. And so mm -hmm. here, the, the, the unifying factor, the common denominator, whether it was police brutality, a global pandemic, vigilante justice, 
-hmm. was that the people who died were African American. Mm, wow. And and so how does that make African Americans feel? Mm. You know, that you've explained some of the factors that went into the tensions, I guess, the rising tensions. Mm -hmm. Um I imagine if it was members of my community, if if they were Adventists and I heard you know, police were going to an Adventist home and Adventists were stopped on the street and, and killed by police. I would start thinking, hey, one, am I being targeted? Two, am I safe in my own spaces? You know, my own home, like to go into the house and, and have that happen, that's that's terrifying. So how is the community feeling? Well, it's it's out, it's outrageous, really. I mean, it's, Jared, let me, and, and uh, let me just give you this perspective. And if, I'll, I'll try my best not to be emotional, but it's very difficult to, to hold in the amount of hurt and the frustration and the outrage that this is happening. Uh, my daughter is eight years old now. My yes. daughter, um, the other night, she heard me brief, debriefing with uh, Carla, my wife, talking about the news, talking about what was going on. Uh, she hears me on phone calls. She hears me in interviews and conversations with spiritual leaders because I'm asking spiritual leaders to take a stand and talk about this. And uh, you'd be surprised how many uh, people of the Adventist movement uh, don't want to deal with these issues. And it's, it's, at a, it's at an all time high, the level of tension. And I think this is the best time to deal with it. And, and so uh, my daughter hears this and she I have to now explain to her why it is that um, this, these riots are taking place. And I, I began to weep when I realized that she is now the same age I was when my parents explained to me the riots that were taking place in Los Angeles after police nearly killed by physically beating him, Rodney King, in the streets. And so I had to explain, and I, I broke into tears because I realized 30 years have passed and nothing has changed. It's just uh, generational. It's a, it's a curse on the system that just keeps, you're, you're realizing that there's been no movement in 30 years from that absolutely. place where your parents were. Absolutely. And, you, you know, I work with people, I work with a, a a lot of people from diverse backgrounds. And uh, I lived in Australia for a couple of years and uh, I'm working now in, in this role. And one of the challenges that we face is that there is this notion that we should just get over it. You know, you, we, why do we keep having to apologize? Why do we keep having to take responsibility for something? That was our answer, so that wasn't us. Yeah. But the effects of that, as we, as we all know, the effects of that are, are ongoing. It's, 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 not, um, it's not linear, it, 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 meaning it doesn't just flow down. You're talking about it's cyclical, it's passed down, it's revived over and over mm -hmm. again. And so it's, it's a very painful. I'm a pastor. I've been pastoring since I was 21 years old. And mm -hmm. I pastored in rural South Carolina. I was arrested three times simply because wow. of the color of my skin. One mm -hmm. time I was arrested because my license plate was not illuminated. How many people will go to jail <laughs> because their license plate is not illuminated? Another time I was arrested because I fit the description of someone that stole a car, even though I was driving my personal vehicle and I could present my, my documents and uh, then arrested again for, I was always released. I didn't have to serve days or months or weeks or anything like that uh, released, but I was detained. I was handcuffed and it didn't matter that I had on a suit. It didn't matter that I had uh, my ministerial credentials. I remember in one instance, my robe, uh, my clergy robe, because it was a communion Sabbath and I was arrested on a Sabbath evening, my robe was laying on the seat, but it was because of the color of my skin. And uh, I've been pulled over lots of times. And, uh, and, and I just, I didn't want to accept that I was being profiled, but I was. And, and um, this, these are the types of, 
frustrations that we have to experience. Did you know, I don't know if you knew this or not, and I'll be sharing some of these uh, resources with you. Uh, this mm. is a link from uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America. And they researched the likelihood of African Americans being shot and killed or killed by police officers. And the risk is significantly higher. You're talking about almost 35% higher that an African American would be killed by police. That means one in every 1,000 African American males like me should expect to be killed by police. And that number goes up by almost 15% between the age of 20 and 35. And so that's, that's, that, that's a really difficult statistic to, to grasp and to comprehend. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge and it's even more challenging when my place of safety, our churches, my mm -hmm. faith community don't lend their voices to the plight that we face. Mm, wow. yeah, let's talk a little bit about that, John, because you know, uh, some of what you've just shared is, is, is terrifying. <laughs> I've, I've been pulled over a few times, but never arrested. And you get nervous when the police are around, but to, to be in fear for your life, I just don't like, it doesn't compute for me. And that I guess is, is cause I, I am blessed to have a different life situation, but you mentioned the church. Um, can we explore because people say, I've, I've read a lot on Facebook recently, people are saying true true followers of Jesus, the true gospel has no place for racism. Um, um, Jesus is anti-racist. He's, he's, he's inclusive of everyone. He's not like that. Um, and so if you're truly um, a, a Christian, you don't, you're not a racist. And, and so I think maybe some of us use that as an excuse not to look at I guess the systematized racism that's in some of our churches and institutions and, and, and the countries that we live in. Um, uh, yes, I believe Jesus is against racism and we can all sign up for that, but it's a little harder to look at some of the ways the systems that we belong to or even Christian church itself has in the past um, set up some of these, these systems and then is still in that place is still in some of those places where they're perpetuating uh, 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 the the privilege, the systems, the racism. They're, they're perpetuating some of those things. Sure. Um, can you talk to that for the Adventist church? Because there might be people watching Adventist church members who don't believe the Adventist church has a, a problem or, or it's something we should even get involved in. I, uh, you know, Jared, it, it is a big problem. I, um, I'm going to start with a personal experience, and then I want to go to a thesis by uh, Kessia Bennett, one of the mm -hmm. uh, students. A couple, a few years ago, she wrote this out of Andrews University about systemic racism in the Adventist church. We have to keep in mind that the Adventist church is global, and for that reason, this is the, the concept or the principle of racism, it, um, it, the, the principle has to be underscored. How, how it's explored and how we talk about it looks differently in Australia with, uh, with dominant culture leaders and, and non-dominant cultural leaders. And so in Australia, it's gonna be Caucasian Australian and uh, or Australians as it's commonly referred and indigenous or Aboriginal. In the United States of America is gonna be white and ca or Caucasian and African American or Native American or Hispanic American. And so it's gonna look different. In South Africa, um, it's, 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 it's gonna look very different. So with that being said, I am going to talk about it in America. The, this is where okay. the Advent movement evolved in, in terms of its corporate identity, its corporate structure. As a, as a movement, um, racial integration and the black civil rights, uh, according to Cassia Bennett, they were not on the same level or the importance as the teaching of the seventh day Sabbath or the advent of Jesus Christ. And because they weren't on the same level, the reconciliation that needed to take place took a back seat, okay? So that meant that the integration uh, and, and equality of African Americans and white Americans uh, and their civil rights of African Americans 
could not be compromised at the cost or expense of the propagation of the Advent message or the Sabbath truth, okay? So it was a very dangerous, dangerous situation in the South. And early Adventist missionaries, they emphasized racial equality, even though it was necessary to concede to the customary behaviors of the South. And over time, and listen very closely to me on this, I'm gonna take about, uh, I think I could do this in about 142 seconds, okay? Over time, by deciding that racial segregation needed to be considered so that the gospel could continue to thrive, there was internal communication about the, the dangers and the evils and the wickedness of racism, but to continue to grow, the external communication began to lack. You following me? Okay. So, so let, let me reframe that in another way, just so I know I've got it, right? So what you're saying is to, and I've got some of this, um, the Adventist History podcast, he's gone through some of the color line Sort yeah, of Matthew, he's in the same union here. Yeah. Great, great information on that podcast. But he, essentially, what you're saying is so that we were accepted by the society, the Southern American society, which had in place segregation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, because we wanted the everlasting gospel to go to all the earth, right? We wanted right. the three angels' messages, the Advent message. We, were quiet. Okay, we have <laughs> lost Jared there, I think. Is yeah, that right? <laughs> but yeah, just to reiterate, we 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 were quiet. Now I'll, 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 I want to read it exactly how uh, Miss Bennett wrote it. Okay, here this the this is this is the 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 core of it. The already complex task of, of navigating the racially segregated South was difficult already, but when circumstances Ex demanded adaptation to social customs that were contrary to the gospel, they conceded. And so mm -hmm. the question had to be asked, how can missionaries adapt without adopting? And that wasn't fully considered, okay? And I'm talking about the church and how the church responds to this. And so the recommendations that, that she made were that our, our principles have to be considered internally and externally for the sake of the gospel and not be confused by the gospel itself. So in the South with the Advent movement, the result was an over identification of the American Adventist church with the unjust social systems of its surroundings and the institutionalization of racism. In other words, to, to, to in the, for the sake of the gospel, racism became an institutionalized component of the Adventist movement in the United States. So Jared, to that question, I grew up, listen to me very closely. I grew up in a church that was called a black church and the white church was on another side of town. Wow. I went to an Adventist school that was called the black school and the white school, Adventist school, was on another side of town. I went to a black camp in the summer and the white camp was an hour away, okay? We would borrow their boats so that we could do canoeing on our, in our camps, okay? We'd borrow their horses so that our children could ride horses. This is in the Adventist church. I know that all of the listeners are not Adventists and every faith community has different challenges that they navigate but you're asking me to tell the truth and I'm gonna tell the truth, okay? I, um, I grew up uh, going to a black big camp that was an hour and a half from the white big camp. Mm -hmm. My school was not as nice. Mm -hmm. My church was not as nice. Mm -hmm. My camp was not as nice. My big camp was not as nice. I'm talking about the amenities. The experience mm -hmm. was rich. The message was the same, but from, from the, the Emancipation Proclamation to the desegregation of the South to what you would call the Jim Crow laws, in other words, it evolved, the racism evolved, the yeah. church, those elements stayed with the church.
and, and, and it continues. And so it's especially difficult for Adventist millennials and Adventist young adults who grew up going to the white school or the black school and, and or going to the white church or the black church or the white camp or the black camp. It's especially difficult because we have to acknowledge that we have not reconciled this, this departure from God's mm -hmm. intention within ourselves. And so mm -hmm. it's very painful when people say all lives matter. Mm -hmm. Jesus did not say, blessed are all lives. He said, blessed are the poor. He mm -hmm. identified the disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. He identified those that were overlooked or underserved. And, uh, and so I hope I'm not trying to preach in any way. I'm just trying to share my experience. So let me shut up a little bit. <laughs> it just, it's just incredible that like, for me, when I think about the segregation of whites and blacks in America, I think of movies like The Help and these sort of films that were, you know, set in the mid 1900s, like a long time before I would assume, you know, you were born, but it seems that this is a lot more recent than I had, I, I knew. So at what point, did this segregation within the Adventist church in your experience stop? And is there still elements of that today? It hasn't stopped. It hasn't stopped. Oh. Yeah, it hasn't so stopped. Still are there still black, black and white camps today? For, for the sake of, of equality, there has been a, a longstanding need for black conferences. Okay, those black conferences do not prevent white people from joining them or Caucasian people or Hispanic people or Portuguese people, Brazil. It doesn't prevent the same vice versa with the Caucasian conference. It's just that it's a historical departure that has never truly been addressed. It's still present in our schools, camps, ministry initiatives. And um, there are a lot of churches that when integrated, we call it the great white flight in America, when integrated, the Caucasian population of those churches, when inundated with people of color, they seem to disperse and those churches become churches of color, still in the Caucasian corporate church structure, but uh, a church of color. And so uh, it, it's, it's difficult. I just wanna say this, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sending these links as they, as they come. And this is an additional link so that you can understand the evolution of those conferences and what it means. Uh, I'm sending that to Mellon. When, when Ellen White was 76, referred to the color question, she wrote in 1903, in different places and under different circumstances, the subjects will need to be handled differently. But 41 years before she wrote that, and I just sent the link so you can see the entire paper. When Mrs. White was 35 years old, just three years younger than I am right now, she and her young associates leading the Adventist uh, movement felt that the North, because the, 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 the civil war of the United States between the North and the South was, was primarily, almost completely around the subject of slavery, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, she felt that the North was guilty of being too moderate of its pursuit of the war. And at the time, Mrs. White had complained, and these are her exact words, the prosecution of this war, the slow, inefficient moves, the inactivity of our armies, inactivity of our armies. So here, she wasn't a gradualist. And, you know, people keep saying she was zealous. She was a reformer. And she was full blown about fixing this thing. Like, let's end this once and for all. And, uh, but I want to just say that it's, it's a very painful thing when people say to me or to my people or any oppressed people group that it just takes time. Jared and Mellon, I have, I had to see the riots in LA and three decades later, my child is now seeing the riots across this country for the same exact reason. I grew up and this is one of the reasons I celebrate it being in Australia. I know that Australia has issues in racism and, and, and there are systems of systemic oppression that exists. I know that, that that happens all over the world, but I value that I didn't have to raise my daughter in a country where there were black churches or black conferences and white conferences. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and I, I don't believe the black conferences, or let me say this, the, the regional conferences, that's the politically correct term, they are more equipped 
to deal with the geographical distribution of ministry resources. And so ideally, the state conferences, which is the politically correct term for white conferences, would be better suited to be absorbed into the regional conferences. But do you really think that will ever happen? <laughs> no, people, people are threatened by change and, and people won't want to lose jobs and, and, and power. I have heard um, some African-American people push back on the idea of, because because when I heard the idea that there were still sort of these separate conference systems in America, I was kind of horrified. I was like, really, that still happens today? But I hear that there is some support in the community because it gives black leadership a chance in the church. Yes. They, they, they don't get... It's critical. It's critical. So can, can you just speak to that just for me to get my head around it? Why, why it wouldn't work just to tomorrow rip up these systems and say, no, this, this isn't ideal because what would be lost and, 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 and why, is, why do we still have this? Why, uh, why do people still argue that this is a necessary um, setup? Even if you, you know, maybe you say, well, it's not, we need to, we need to work on this, but uh, it's hard for me to get my head around. Matt, Jared, there, there were four, Calvin B. Rock in, um, in, in his book, Protest and uh, Progress, it, it addresses the administrative structure of the Adventist church in the United States. And I'm sharing that link right now. And it's a really a broad overview, but there were four major pushes for administrative uh, integration in 1889 mm -hmm. and 1929. That was the first which failed, it failed, it, that, that trying to get that to happen where there was equality, uh, it didn't happen. Because remember, I told you that the racism has now become institutionalized in the church and, yes. um, and or by the church. And then between 1929 and 1944, there was a push for regional conferences. And remember that's code word for black conferences, okay? That's the politically correct yeah. term. And those regional conferences are regionally organized. So that, that's significant uh, still to point out. That succeeded, that was successful. So listen, we failed between 1889 and 1929 to have an integrated approach to administration because it meant shared power. Mm -hmm. But we were successful as long as we were separate and equal. Right. Mm. But in my life, I've seen the fruit of that. I'm one generation removed, two generations, I'm sorry, removed from that, uh, that move for regional conferences. And my dear friend, my experience, my experience was rich, but the mm -hmm. resources were not the same, okay? Mm -hmm. Right. And then there was a push between 69, 1969 and 80 for black union conferences and that failed. And then there was a push for a separate equitable retirement system for regional conference employees. I know the architect of this. He is a very good friend of mine and a mentor. His name is Joe McCoy, Pastor Joe McCoy. Uh, and that was successful between 1998 and the year 2000. And so Rock, he addresses these things, Calvin B. Rock, and um, he, he terms it all of the efforts, what it births in the African-American experience, modified self-determinationism. Mm -hmm. Modified <laughs> self-determinationism. And here, if we do not have full integration, I know Australia is talking about a new uh, leadership structure and that's not uh, promulgated that idea by driven by race, but in America, we certainly need that. And, and let me tell you something, it breaks my heart when we see these things happen and our Seventh-day Adventist pastors and churches say things like all lives matter or blue lives matter. And um, Christ did not denigrate the 99 in his pericope about the sheep. They were safe and they were cared for, but he left and exposed himself to, to the elements and harm, the shepherd in, in Christ's pericope to go for the one. And all lives can't really matter if black lives don't matter. And so here, when you talk about um, what that looks like and, and what that means, I hope I unpack that just a, a little bit. Some Adventists in North America raise questions about the wisdom or 
even the necessity, not says in the review of this book of our current system. And in my generation, you know, mm -hmm. we're sick of it. We're sick of it. We, we don't, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, you, Jared, you literally have two presidents in the same state of the seven day Adventist church. Yeah. Mm. Yep. But, but when you talk about putting yourself like the shepherd at risk or exposing yourself, it's going to require those in positions of power and those in positions of privilege, the, the dominant cultural group to say, because we've had enough official statements. Uh, we're tired of official. The reason we have to keep making official statements, the first official statement that I see from the Adventist church in my lifetime was in 1985, okay? And um, mm -hmm. I, I reviewed that official statement and you can look that up. I'm not gonna give you a link for that. Uh, but it, it, <laughs> at any rate, the point that I wanna make is that um, we have made in my lifetime, as far as I can track, I'm 38 years old. I can find 56 different official statements about oppression around the world. And, and, mm -hmm. and for me, if we're going to be salt and light, we've got to stop making official statements and we've got to start taking official action. Our church can't have power uh, to reach hearts in the United States when people know we have a segregate, segregated corporate church structure. Mm. So how much do you think, sorry, go ahead. No, Ellen. you go, Jared. It's fine. It's you go. I was going to say, how much do you think it, 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 it holds back the work of the gospel, having that separated, like what mm. you just ended on, having that separated system, how much does it impact um, African-Americans and people of yeah. color joining the Adventist church? I think in some ways, God has, the Holy Spirit has used the departure from, from God's intention for us. How powerful would it have been if in the, uh, during the desegregation of the South and in the United States, uh, how powerful would it have been if the Advent movement was also desegregated? And it, but, but that would have been powerful, however, there's a lot of research that suggests that segregation uh, is significant. It, it's important for me, as it would have been for ab Aboriginal Indigenous children. Rowan Deanshaw was the principal of the Kimsey Adventist School in Kimsey, New South Wales, and he did a mm -hmm. brilliant job. He and Leanne Lessig and uh, Vanessa, their team did a brilliant job serving a very diverse school population, school community. And their school and the Adventist ministry of that school represented the community they served. And, and so I think that's appropriate. In a, in a state or a city where it's almost completely homogenous, Caucasian, you don't need that kind of diversity, okay? But in places where, like where I grew up in South Florida, where I didn't know there were so many Americans in America until I went to college, because I grew up with people from all over the world, particularly the Caribbean and Central America, and um, and I just did. I had no idea. I was like, "You're from America?" Like I thought, you know, I was, I was like, well, I thought I was the last one. And um, so, which was a beautiful thing. But the point that I'm making is that in those situations, it's. Um, I think our churches are are going to have to be able to cater to those different needs. And for that reason, I believe the Holy Spirit has used that that structure. Uh, to advance the gospel in a powerful way. But remember, racism became institutionalized because we were internally cognizant of communicating unity and reflecting the will of God. But externally, we communicated that we were going to comply with the racial segregation. And so at this point in time, I believe uh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, it was probably the best thing that could be done okay by human standard right. but at this time we need to do something different mm. do you do you think we have the same problem with um because what you're saying is that we externally we externally wanted to look good we, we we wanted to be acceptable to society are we doing the same thing by making statements now we have to make a statement because everyone's making statements. So as an official church, we hate racism. 
We want to support the families of um, some of the victims. Uh, full stop. That's that's. Sure, sure. But we're not doing anything more about it. Is that an external sort of of the same pattern? It, it is the same pattern. It's, it's actually, it's a futile effort. The statements are important, but if, if, if that's all we've got, that's nothing at all, okay? I wish our statements included, we condemn this under no uncertain terms. We condemn this. And these are the things we are doing. Mm -hmm. Okay? It really, it seems to even reflect because, you know, we're talking about this institutionalized segregation and things like that, which is one thing. But then I guess on a practical level, the question I'm sort of, you know, holding on to here is, well, how can I make a difference? Or how can the average American make a difference in this context where you do have this structure in place? And like I've seen on Instagram, a lot of people using the hashtag, you know, Blackout Tuesdays, Black, Black Lives Matter, all of these things. And it's almost as though individuals now are making public statements. Like how, how do we personally navigate this whole thing? I think we, we have to ask ourselves, I, uh, I'm, I, I, I wanna say this and a friend of mine, uh, I was talking about this and I'm very, I was very grateful for you all and it, at the record doing this. I'm grateful for, uh, George Muno's statement. Uh, I don't, I'm not trying to diminish any mm. statements made by anyone, but it's particularly powerful when a statement comes from the other side of the world. But when you're here and you can make a difference and a difference has not been made, it diminishes the impact of what you're trying to accomplish. So thank you for what you have done. Um, when you talk about it personally, if you look at the life of Ellen White, um, not as a model or an example, but I'm referencing her life. Her position evolved over time. And when I say it evolved, meaning she personally spoke against racism. And I, the resource I gave you earlier, um, uh, you can use those. That it's, it's a powerful examination of that. But the, I think there's one more I need to make sure you get. No, I got, you got that one. Okay. Did I give you the link for uh, Dr. Rock's book? No, I didn't. Let me make sure I, I give that to you. I'm sending that now. Okay. There we go. All right. Now we're all caught up here. I think we have to evolve in our personal uh, contribution. What, what I'm saying is if I am an African-American, I have to ask myself, what more can I do? For non-African Americans, the question needs to be asked, what more can I do? Why is it that we can't put an end to these racially segregated corporate church structures for the greater good? Think about the millions upon millions of dollars that could go to further the gospel. I think it's important to, I'm, I'll do this in my very last comments, but uh, I just want to say it here. It's critically important for us to accept we're not going to change anybody's mind. Google is a is a global phenomenon and if someone truly wants to be informed they will be jared you reached out to me and you said i'd like to have this conversation and and you didn't stop there you said and if you're not available because of the times on the difference we will go to someone else to have this conversation this is what it requires it requires there's a a principle in an in interfaith work it, it's really a principle in collaboration it's called taking the other to lunch, meaning I want to I want to spend time with you and I want to understand. And we need more of that. I experienced uh, racism in Australia, one instance, just one instance. Uh, but I experienced it in the same place uh, that I also experienced the beautiful story of what was happening at the Kimsey Adventist School with Rowan Deanshaw to see what they were doing. And so the point that I'm making to you is that for those that want to understand, they have to take the initiative to understand and to listen and to ask, could you, could you help me uh, unpack this? When I was there, you know, I just left. Not, it hasn't even been six months yet since I left mm -hmm. and uh, I miss it. The flag is still red, white and blue, but the water is very different here. And uh, <laughs> one of the things that I remember when someone talked to me and they did not know that there were 
racially segregated or divided along racial lines conferences. They had no idea, had never heard it. Matter of fact, they didn't even believe me. They had to look it up and come back and say, couldn't believe it. And I think from that, we became good friends. And I think that, uh, I don't, I think that person decided that I am going to be informed so that I can be impactful. You can't make an impact without information. Mm. And so that's a, that's interesting on the, the personal level. What about the corporate level? Do you have any thoughts on as a as a church and as representatives of the church? What can we be doing better, rather than just making statements? I you know I, I do want to remember I said there are layers in the United States to to what we're yes. dealing with. we're dealing with police brutality. Okay, blacks are not the only ones that die from police brutality, but they died a disproportionate number. Okay, you could mm -hmm. almost expect one in every 1,000 black men to die from police brutality. That's, that's a painful statistic, but it's true. Um, you're also dealing with uh, systemic oppression, okay? How is it that we can go to beautiful, and I'm talking about in a faith context, in my, our faith community at Seventh-day Adventist, um, I'm gonna say something that's gonna be probably not, I'm, I'm going to be politically correct, but I, I went to, uh, I think I went to four or five big camps when I was in uh, the South Pacific, four or five. Mm -hmm. The AtSim tents or the AtSim ministries, they did not have the level of attention that some of the other tents and ministry areas had. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm not condemning. I'm just pointing something out. Mm. Were they happy? Yes. Were they, did they celebrate? Was the worship beautiful? Absolutely. And, and everything else was normal and the same. But in situations like that, someone who is in the dominant cultural group needs to say, what do we need to do to enhance mm. this, this ministry? In, in my context, um, whether the African-American uh, conference leaders will agree with this or not, I don't know. I don't know where I, I stand with them, okay? But it would be a powerful notion if the uh, dominant cultural group, the Caucasian conference leaders said, can we do big camp together? Mm -hmm. Okay? That's a step, right? Mm -hmm. right. And so these are the types of uh, steps that I I'm suggesting we could take as a church. Now, in terms of the community, we have to acknowledge that systemic oppression exists and we have to look closely at the ministry of Jesus Christ. Christ, he attended to the marginalized. There's a mm -hmm. book that I want to share with you. And um, this is by... Uh, a very celebrated theologian named James Cone. And he wrote the book called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And he correlates the, the tree that was used that would they would take ropes and put them around African-Americans necks and pull them up and kill them by strangulation. And he, he correlates that to the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And here, um, fundamentally, we have to consider how Christ went after the marginalized. I see beautiful mission trips, magnificent mission trips. I love that Blair Lemke, uh, while he served on a mission trip as the young adult leader and led a mission trip to the Philippines, he also went to the outback. And, and I think that what, we, what can we do locally is our question. And um, when you talk about the marginalized, African-Americans are marginalized statistically, historically, geographically, we're marginalized. And our church as a whole needs to speak out. Should we speak out for everyone? Absolutely, that's marginalized. But I'm speaking as an African-American in this movement. I love my church, uh, but this is a glaring sin that, that we, need to, we need to overcome. And what you're doing is one of those things. You talk about it. You don't allow people to... Um, you don't allow racist comments to pass. You hold it accountable. Mm -hmm. And when you, when, when someone is in a, a part of the dominant cultural group, 
you have to always ask yourself in reference to the ministry of Jesus Christ. First, he left heaven. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then he decided to be born in Bethlehem. <laughs> he touched people that were untouchable. Mm -hmm. He went to homes of people where uh, someone of purity or power, a position of power should not have been. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, I, I, I could go on and on, but I think you, he found himself in a precarious position so much so that he was accused of being a sinner and a wine bibber. Okay. And, and so I think unless people think that you're doing something wrong, <laughs> you probably aren't on the right track when it, when it comes to reaching out to the marginalized. Okay. Mm. Wow. We, we what about a... protesting, John? What about joining with people who are marching for this sort of thing? Yeah. That yeah. sort of activity is suspicious to us as Adventists. We're like, Oh, we don't, we don't do that. That's, that's uncomfortable know, for us. I know, and I'm sad to hear that. But um, I, I think that Jesus would be with the protesters. Now, mm. I, I do want to say this. Looters are looting. Mm. Yep. In the words of Sabrina Fulton. Yeah, in the words of Sabrina Fulton, the mother of Trayvon Martin, uh, who she's largely considered, she's a Miami girl. We're, that's a home girl. Yeah, largely considered the... Uh, new generation Emmett Till. And if you don't know those stories, just Google those names. But she said that, let's be clear, the looters are looting, but the protesters, mm -hmm. the overwhelming majority, the protesters are protesting. And mm -hmm. um, you don't have to conflate uh, or, or combine those two into one sum. I saw someone uh, post recently and they said, this is why African-Americans are getting what they deserve because all they're doing is destroying. And and there's so many layers to that. They're antagonists that, that come into our communities and set things on fire as an opportunity to make it look like we did it. Some of my people, they do things out of anger and frustration and fear and pain. And uh, one, one, one leader said that rioting is the language of the unheard. It's the language of the yes. unheard. And, uh, but as far as protesting goes, should we protest? Yes, yeah, yeah, we should. As, as Adventists, we should. And we should be the first ones to organize peaceful protests. Uh, Dr. Carlton P. Byrd organized the peaceful protest. I don't know an exact number. I would say over a thousand, but easily hundreds of people in that city came. There was no violence. There was no looting. Um, one of the pastors in Minneapolis, uh, she was a part of a silent clergy march. And uh, she got to sit at the table and organizing that. And so the point that I'm bringing to you is that you should protest and you should be the first to protest, to speak out. Uh, our church spoke strongly against prohibition of alcohol and, 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 and why we needed to, and tobacco. And, and when I say spoke against, not spoke against, but spoke for lifestyle adjustments. So the point that I'm making is that that's our role that's our role. We, we are biblical social justice is, is, is a hallmark of our identity. And always has been. Yeah. As Adventists. Absolutely. In the comments, we've just had a few um, mentions of the idea of leadership. Charlie Perth um, made a few comments about our churches need to be I need to more clearly articulate what kind of qualities are vital for prospective leaders. And then Martin. Rensberg um, talks about uh, it's a call for adaptive leadership. It's not about finding the best non, best non or most available fix to a problem, but instead of adapting to the changing environment or circumstances. And there's a few more comments like that as well. What would your advice be? Because I mean, we've already got leaders in place. You know, how do we create that systemic change in leadership specifically? Does it require more education? Does it require shuffling? Like, what 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 do you think? I think it requires uh, not one or the other. It's not binary. It's all, all efforts should be considered, but we should, uh, one thing we should do more than anything else is stop talking and start doing. It would be better to move in a direction that needs to be adjusted than to sit around committee tables and do nothing at all. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of identifying the challenges and speaking to them, that's important, but we should be leaving those conversations around how we will craft our statements. We should leave those conversations around how we will craft our solutions. And we mm -hmm. should, should present those solutions on a regular basis. And just like uh, we have external qualities that make our church beautiful and internal qualities that make our church beautiful. There are external practices and qualities that make us unattractive and mm -hmm. external practices and qualities that make us unattractive. And so we need to look at how can we effectively minister to the marginalized and, um, and we should do that. Our corporate leaders have been elected. Listen to this one. Our corporate leaders were appointed and elected in the process that we follow in, in our Adventist ministries around the world to, to represent the move of God on his people, okay? And so if leaders are in positions that reflect inactivity on matters of so, biblical social justice, it is because that is a reflection of the people that have appointed them. And so until we as individuals in the local context very broadly decide that we want leaders that represent activity on these matters, we won't see that. And I'm not asking you to uh, remove someone from office or appoint someone to office. I'm saying that, that that's something that happens with us as individuals and our leaders only reflect. That's why uh, I won't get mm. into the politics in a secular context, but that, that's why we have the kind of democracy. And I know we don't like to use that word externally, but we, that's why we have the, that kind of democracy in our churches. And, and that's mm. important to, to be reflected. I know pastors that are afraid to speak out. They're afraid to say something because their members uh, feel that it's inappropriate or it's not Adventist. But the only non-Adventist thing that you can do on matters of social justice is be quiet. That's the only non-Adventist thing you can do. Wow. Hey, John, um, we're running out of time probably for today. It's flown by. Um, it's been very informative for me and I'm sure for our viewers. Um, there's a lot to process there and, and to unpack. And, and you've provided us some links for some extra reading. So I'd recommend you know anyone that's interested um, get into those links because I'm sure there's some valuable information there. Um, next week, we're hoping to have our friends from Matsim join us. Um, we're we're going to have a conversation, a similar conversation, but around uh, some closer to home issues with our our Indigenous and, and Aboriginal family in, in this country. So um, we value your time um, today, John, but is there anything, is there anything else is there anything you'd just like to say to, to, to bring us home uh, that maybe you haven't said or that you'd like to, to re-emphasize for us um, as we go into our communities, into our families this week? What are we, where are we going? What does that look like? My, my African Americans are under a great deal of stress right now, uh, just emotionally, and, and it's immensely exhausting. I um, mm. got a text message from my big brother, Darren Pratt, who's the children's ministries leaders in um, North New South Wales. And he said, yes. I'm checking on you. How are you? So mm. that's one. If you have friends that are uh, marginalized uh, as a race, as a people, as an ethnic group, call and check on them because this affects them, I assure you. That's something that wow. you could do personally. That's a big movement. When Jared wrote yep. me and said, I'd like to hear how it impacts you. Are you okay? That made a difference in my life. It made me someone who feels unheard. It made me feel heard. Wow. And um, a friend of mine who's a police officer in Sydney, he said, I just want to say I'm sorry because I know that this impacts you. And, um, and I want you to know that we're not all that way. And we condemn that. We condemn what we saw. And those things can change someone's heart. Someone who's exhausted, that can give them energy. So if you're looking for a way to be very powerful, a way to be very powerful is to be very personal. And so mm -hmm. I wanna encourage you to do that. In your church, I want you to speak, speak out against uh, racial inequalities, bigotry, don't allow it. Don't say, oh, that's just the way he is, or that's just the way she is. Don't do that because that's not Christ-like. 
Christ-ness. Christ would ask us to, to speak to the truth of the matter in love so that, because it's not love to leave someone where they are in their hatred, but to let them know that's not acceptable here. And we'd be more than happy to help support you through the journey to overcome that. And my final uh, thing I wanna say is that um, in your prayers, it's good to ask God to bless the oppressed, but it would be appreciated by myself. And I believe heaven would appreciate it if you not only ask God to bless the oppressed, but ask God how you can be a blessing to the oppressed and listen closely to what he has to say for your journey. Powerful words there, John, and very practical as well, being able to, yeah, just be reminded to reach out to those who are oppressed um, in our immediate circles, because ultimately, I guess, you know, we can't change the world as an individual, but we can change the world around us. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for joining us again. And it's, what, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. there, so we really, really appreciate it. 3 a.m. Thanks, Melanie. 3 a.m. Thank, <laughs> thank you to the record. Thank you so much. No hey, John, um, I think on that note, if, if you don't mind, we should end on a prayer. Um, we, we prayed before we started. Obviously, that was off, off the, live, the live shoot. But um, I'm just wondering if you can model that for us, if you can pray. I don't feel with all the processing that I've got to do now, I don't, I don't feel ready to necessarily say the right words or to, to, mm. to, to pray in this spot. But I, I would be honored and blessed if you would pray. Um, yeah. for us and, and for for your yourself and, and the situation of your brothers and sisters there in the states and, and around the world um yeah, if you would do us that honor that that would be that would be a beautiful thing let's pray father thank you so much for the adventist record here in australia across the south pacific thank you for their heart to to tell the stories of the people that they serve father i ask that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm. Lord, there are things that make me feel powerless. I ask that you would give me the opportunity to make a difference for those that are marginalized around me, for my people as African Americans, but also for my people as a member of the Christian family. Lord, mm. I pray that you would speak to my heart to find confidence in knowing that one day you will rectify all of the wrong and the racism and the injustice in the world, the injustice in the world. Until that time comes, Lord Jesus, please use me as an instrument of hope. Please use me as an instrument of peace and inspiration and power for those in the world that feel powerless. I pray for every person tuning in. I pray for Adventists around the world. And I pray for every human being who has come under the thumb of oppression, that Lord, your gospel would reach them. A gospel that God will come to change the world, but he comes right now to change the heart. We thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate your time uh, mm -hmm. and the wisdom and the, the humility that you've shared with us. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, and you, I want to say you changed my life. I, being here, not in a major metropolitan area, as I've always served, I feel like I can't be as involved as I would like, but you made me feel heard. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that mm -hmm. makes a difference. I was tired, I was crying, I was depressed. But uh, you've given me an opportunity to, uh, to, to be revitalized in my experience and in my journey. And I thank you for that, especially. Praise the Lord. Thank you, John. Uh, that's all we have time for today. We hope you join us next week with our AdSim family. Uh, that's going to be a really important conversation as well, because they're, um, as John reflected a little bit in his remarks, uh, really unseen portion of our community and and the Adventist church is doing amazing things in that community but as mainstream or majority uh, Adventists Caucasian Australian Adventists and even multicultural Adventists we don't often engage with the ATSIM work or understand what's happening in some of those spaces so 
we hope you join us next week to to hear from from those folks and to uh, yeah um, uh, hear some of their stories as well. But until then, God bless you all. Uh, go in peace. This is a crazy time and a crazy year for all of us. But yeah, we just pray your protection and 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 that you're close to God in this time uh, and wherever you find yourself. <laughs>